Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our fifth Chifley conversation for 2022. I'd just like to begin with an acknowledgement of country. As people will be aware, the office of the, and I'm speaking to you this evening from the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, as do, does our guest, the Honourable Gareth Evans, ACQC. We'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we're speaking from and those on the lands on which our audience is joining us from tonight. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Well, our guest this evening is a self-labelled incorrigible optimist. He was once described by Bob Hawke as having the most acute mind of any of Bob's ministers, and that's up against some pretty tough competition. It's common for many people to describe Gareth as a central figure in Australian politics for the last two decades, as he served in both houses of parliament, led the ALP in the Senate, and was deputy leader of the parliamentary party during his time in the House of Representatives. He was also, of course, one of the most influential cabinet ministers across the entirety of the Hawke and Keating governments. But Gareth's done a bit more than that, and he does continue to do so. He's recognised globally for his contributions to public affairs, international relations and academic discourse. These contributions have been significant, broad ranging and span, among other things, across the fight against apartheid, international conflict prevention and resolution, arms control and disarmament, and of course, more recently, the doctrine of the responsibility to protect. Indeed, Foreign Policy magazine recognised Gareth as a top 100 global thinker in 2011 for making the responsibility to protect doctrine more than something just academic. Fortunately for all of us, Gareth shows no signs of stopping, something we're in part recognising tonight. Um, on the eve of the launch of his latest book, Good International Citizenship, The Case for Decency. This is the 14th book that Gareth has written or edited, along with multiple newspaper articles and around 150 journal articles, chapters, and also reports on foreign relations, human rights, legal and constitutional reform. And that's without mentioning the speeches. So tonight, I want to welcome you, Gareth. Um, and I want to begin by asking you to give a brief overview of your book and the case that you're making out especially why we should view good international citizenship as both a moral imperative and a matter of hard-hearted national interest. Over to you. Well, thanks very much, David, for that very generous introduction. I'm always reminded on these occasions of what Adley Stevenson, the US statesman, used to say, that um, flattery is okay as long as you don't inhale. So there we go. But thanks for the generous introduction and thanks for the opportunity to talk to the Chifley Centre, an outfit that I of course, very much admire for the work that you're doing. What this essay is about is a dimension of our foreign policy, which has too often gone missing in recent years, but which in my view is really quite critical, both to our sense of national worth and to our international standing. Everyone gets it that the traditional core business of any country's foreign policy has to be how we protect and advance our national interests in ensuring our physical security and our economic prosperity. There's obviously a lot to discuss about how we manage both these dimensions, the Australia, the US versus China navigation issue and so on. But that's not my focus in this little book. My argument here that I want to develop is that there's a third dimension to any country's national interests, which should also be regarded as core business and not just optional extras, optional add-ons. And that third dimension is being and being seen to be a good international citizen. What do I mean that by that? Well, essentially being seen as a decent country, not just wholly inward looking, wholly self-interested, but a country that others respect and trust and want to emulate. One that genuinely cares about poverty and conflict and human rights abuses and atrocities, about health epidemics, about environmental catastrophes, about weapons proliferation and other problems 
afflicting people very often in places very far from our own shores and very often having little or no direct or immediate impact on our own security or our own prosperity. The response that one very often gets from political hardheads to these issues, as I can certainly testify from my own cabinet experience, is that this the response you get is this is kind of Boy Scout stuff, something nice to do from time to time if there's not much cost or effort involved, but it's not the real business of national government. My answer, which I hope will be seen as compelling, is that we have both a moral imperative and a national interest imperative to be and to be seen to be a good international citizen. But the starting point in making the case for good international citizenship is, is simply that this is the right thing to do. That states, like individuals, have a moral obligation to do the least harm and the most good they possibly can. Answers are obviously going to vary depending on your philosophical or your spiritual bent as to what's the source of that obligation. But the striking thing is just how much convergence there is around basic principles, whether your approach to ethics is religiously based or secular, humanistically based, whatever the cultural tradition one has been brought up in. As one um, British philosopher rather nicely put it, defenders of different approaches to moral reasoning, and uh, whether you're a Christian or for the philosophers among you, whether you're a utilitarian or a Kantian or a Rawlsian or anything else, those different approaches involve climb, climbing, as he put it, climbing the same mountain from different sides. In their different ways, the different ethical traditions, both religious and secular, all point in essentially the same direction, demanding at their core respect for our common humanity. And recognition of respect for our common humanity really is the moral core of the concept of good international citizenship. But, this is a big but, the second part of my case for good international citizenship is that the returns are more than just of the warm inner glow type. Decent behavior can, I argue, generate hard-headed, practical national advantage of the kind that appeals to realists and political cynics, and there's an army of those, as well as to idealists. I argue in this essay that there are three kinds of hard-headed return for a state being and being seen to be a good international citizen. The first of those hard-headed hard -headed returns is, is reputational. The country's general image, how it projects itself, its culture, its values, its policies, how in turn it's seen by others, is a really quite fundamental importance in determining how well it succeeds in advancing and protecting its traditional national interests, security and, and economic. Over many decades of quite active now international engagement, I've witnessed over and again how this soft power, as it's called, matters. It matters in determining whether one's seen as a good country to invest in and trade with, a good country to visit, to study in, to trust in security terms. And it matters in being seen as a good country to support for responsible international leadership positions and to work with in responsible international decision-making forums. The second hard-headed return from good international citizenship is, is reciprocity. Foreign policymakers are no more immune to ordinary human instincts than anyone else. And if I take your problems seriously, you're that much more likely to help me solve my problems. The reciprocity involved is not always in international relations, very explicit or very transparent. Subtlety will often be an advantage in achieving it, but no practicing diplomat will be unaware of the reality, the utility of this reciprocity dynamic, and no government decision maker should be oblivious to it. The third and last of the three returns that I would identify, the hard-headed returns for being and being seen to be a good international citizen, is simply that this helps you make progress on issues where the whole world, including us, does ultimately benefit issues like climate change, but where the national costs for many players might seem for a long time to outweigh any discernible benefits and where the necessary collective international action is accordingly very hard to achieve. The more states that have a cooperative, collective, good international citizenship mindset, the better the chance of these things getting done will be.
There are four big practical benchmarks which matter above all else when one is assessing any country's record as a good international citizen, being a generous aid donor, doing everything we can to protect and advance universally recognized human rights, doing everything we reasonably can to achieve international peace and security to prevent the horror and misery of war, mass atrocity crimes, and to alleviate their consequences, including for refugees fleeing their impact. And finally, my fourth benchmark is being an actively committed participant in attempts to meet the three great existential risks that are posed by health pandemics, by global warming, and by nuclear war. How well have we done against those benchmarks? Australia likes to think of itself as a good international citizen from time to time. We've actually deserved to be so regarded, but only from time to time. Against these benchmarks, my take is that our overall record has been patchy at best, lamentable at worst, and is presently, for the most part, embarrassingly poor. On overseas aid, we've been the worst performed of any rich country donor in terms of the decline in our generosity over the last five decades. On human rights, where what happens at home very much matters abroad, nobody likes a hypocrite, our record has been sometimes okay, sometimes not at all okay, at best mixed. So too with our contributions to international peace and security. A very strong and bipartisan, I'm glad to say, a response in the last few days to Russia's legally and morally indefensible invasion of Ukraine is really a very good example of good international citizenship. Good international citizenship as it, at its best, as I would argue, was also our response, for example, to the first Gulf War, certainly not the second, but the first one in 1991 with Iraq's invasion of Kuwait. But the general record in this context has been pretty patchy in peacemaking diplomacy, responding to mass atrocity crimes. We have on occasion played some pretty important um, positive roles, notably in Cambodia. As international peacekeepers, we've always done actually very well, but we've accepted remarkably few such obligations in recent years. We're, we're hardly visible in that scene at the moment. In the case of actual war fighting, we've been at our best when making our own decisions to fight just wars. Laws, wars that are lawful also under the UN Charter. But I think we've been at our worst when we've been persuaded to go to war for less just causes, usually in the hope of trying to buy alliance insurance for protection against some possible future threats to ourselves. In meeting our responsibilities to refugees and asylum seekers, our record in the past has sometimes been a very proud one, as it was, for example, with Malcolm Fraser and the Indo-Chinese uh, refugees after Vietnam, but in recent years, that record has been little short of absolutely shameful. Though hopefully our response to Ukrainian refugees, I guess it's easier because they're European rather than Afghan or other exotic species. Uh, hopefully that response will, will balance the ledger a little bit. Uh, finally, as to, as to helping meet the three great existential risks to life on this planet as we know it, our uh, international response has really been underwhelming or worse. Maybe you can say a bare pass in the case of pandemics, but it's been a dismal fail in the case of climate change, where our response, as all of this audience will well know, has been grudging, it's been minimalist, it's, been absolute, it's done absolutely nothing to redeem our now well-established international reputation as a climate laggard. On nuclear weapons, one of my major preoccupations in recent years, Australia has played a useful role in the past, and I believe we can again in advancing both nuclear risk reduction and the ultimate, very elusive goal of nuclear weapons elimination. But in recent years, particularly under the current government, our contribution has been more, frankly, of an encumbrance than an encouragement to those objectives. Final thing I want to say, I'm sorry this hasn't been brief, but there's a lot to say. What's intriguing is that on all the available evidence, as I describe in the last section of the essay, which is called The Politics of Decency, on all the available evidence, the problem lies not with the negative attitudes of our people towards these issues, but too often the attitudes of our all too often cynical governments. Australian polling conducted by the Lowy Institute over the last 15 years, which I spell out in detail in the, in the text, 
shows clear and often quite overwhelming public support for just about all my benchmark tests of good international citizenship, public support. Aid at first sight might seem to be a big exception, but on closer examination, it's anything but, and I'm happy to spell that out. We get an opportunity to discuss that in the question time. When governments, my basic point is this, when governments have taken strongly principled good international citizenship positions, they've had no obvious difficulty in taking the Australian community with them. The nervousness that so many of them, so many policymakers in government have shown, has not had any obvious political justification. Maybe these issues are not sufficiently central and salient to actually win elections, but there is no evidence of which I am aware that they lose elections. A country with Australia's general record and reputation as an energetic, creative middle power, which has at many times in the past, particularly under Labor governments, I have to say, played a world leading role in international diplomacy. A government, a country like ours, we should be setting our sights higher. The bottom line is that we, we do have just one planet. We are a global community and our political leaders should give more weight than too many of them have done to what uh, Abraham Lincoln once famously described as the better angels of our nature. Very last of all, as I, as I say in the essay, those in high office might uh, prefer the solution offered by the, uh, the German writer Bertolt Brecht when he suggested they dissolve the people and elect another. But the right course for the rest of us is not to dissolve the electorate, but, but to persuade our political leaders on both moral and national interest grounds to change their way and to vote them out if they don't. So thanks for that. And over to you, David, for uh, our discussion. Well, thank you, Gareth. That was very comprehensive. And uh, we'll get to some audience qu questions in due course. And I just rem remind people in the audience to direct your questions via the Q&A function so that we can uh, repeat them to the, the wider audience. Um, if you can keep them out of the chat, they will, we will be mindful of the chat. But best to direct them to the Q&A function. Uh, if I could sort of kick things off and uh, to uh, mash up your Brechtian an analogy, perhaps draw a, a Caucasian chalk circle and take you back uh, to your point um, about Australia's general record. I mean, it, as you, you said earlier, and as you say in the conclusion of your book, we, you believe we have a a good reputation as an energetic, creative middle power. And part of that's because we've played a world leading role in diplomacy and, and institution building at times. So how do we reconcile this with your judgment um, that we, you know, when it comes to international citizenship, we seem to take a mean spirited frequently antagonistic approach to the precepts of what you think constitutes good international citizenship? Well, David, I guess sometimes a mean spirited approach just comes with the, incorrigibly with the individuals that are involved. When, when you've got a John Howard and a Tampa situation, when you've got Tony Habit, who I particularly remember, he's very fond, we'll all remember of three word phrases when he said, nope, nope, nope to the suggestion that Australia might have a responsible role to play in rescuing 7,000 Rohingyas and Bangladeshis uh, stranded at sea. Uh, when I think of um, Peter Dutton, Passim, uh, mean spiritedness and an inability to, you know, think seriously about taking seriously these issues does seem to come with the, with the territory of those individuals. It's very hard to think of, um, of finding common ground, but I think we've got to keep trying for common ground. And my argument here in this little book that what good international citizenship is about is not just Boy Scout good deeds, not just moral values, which people have might have different views about, but it is also about the pursuit of hard-headed national interest. And it deserves to be ranked right up there alongside the traditional pursuit of um, economic interests and physical security 
interests. And, you know, I've, I've spelled out what those interests are. They're reputational interests, they're reciprocity interests, and they're the interest, of course, also in, in getting some things that might otherwise get done and that do ultimately work to our advantage, even if there's some pain along the way, um, getting done. So if you can get politicians to think about these issues in traditional hard-headed realist terms, appealing to their inner cynics and not just their inner decency, which might well be missing, um, you've got a better chance of finding, I think, um, common ground. I mean, that's that's my story and that's what I'm suggesting to. I, I, I do think bipartisanship is very important. Uh, we've achieved it um, in the past. We've achieved it perhaps temporarily around the current issue of Ukraine. But it's, it's too often gone missing. Too often these issues have been seen as... Um, it's just optional extras, not part of the mainstream business of foreign policy making and implementation. And that encourages ad hocery, it encourages individual grudges and grievances and political uh, you know, volatility and political antagonism to, to take center stage. Whereas if you think about all this as being central to our national identity as it's perceived by others, then there's a better chance of getting more bipartisanship on, on these issues, which I think would be a very good thing. So you're in essence saying that we've got to appeal to the, the political rational mind, um, yet at some length in the book, you know, you describe your own struggles and, you know, you're quite open about the fact that you didn't feel you got as far as you might have liked. And we look at this, you know, in the context of the Lowy polling that you've mentioned, where the ordinary Australian seems more inclined to support greater spending on foreign aid, particularly when they're given a factual context about our actual expenditure and its relative call on the taxpayer dollar. So that's the ordinary Australian. That seems to be a path to persuade them rationally, yet our leadership class who you would assume would be more familiar with that sort of context, still seem reluctant to be persuaded. All right. And uh, how do we change that? Well, I think you've just got to um, keep trying to let, you know, reason trump, trump emotion and, um, and evidence, you know, trump the lack of evidence and just raw uh, irrational um, responses. I mean, it's interesting what you say about aid. I mean, there's an absolute mindset um, in the political class, and I know very well from years of trying to keep an aid budget together with a very hostile expenditure review committee. Uh, my dear friend Peter Walsh, even Bill Hayden, uh, when he was foreign minister, seemed to wear his uh, responsible treasurer's hat rather than his serious foreign policy leader's hat. Um, even on aid, there's a sort of an inbuilt belief that um, you know, the, the community just won't tolerate significant levels of aid. The charity begins at home. Um, you know, Dickens, Mrs. Jellyby, um, all of that sort of stuff that you know, the people are just in. And there is some opinion poll evidence for it, which you'll find being cited all the time. I mean, there's a, the Lowy, um, the first time Lowy tested this um, a few years ago, um, they did in fact find 70, 73%, nearly 80% of the Australian community saying that um, either we were spending you know, far too much or certainly we should under no circumstances be spending any more than they thought that we were. But when that was tested, and this is the point I make in the book, and you know, we shouldn't just assume that these figures are well known because, because they're not. When Lowy tested that the following year, because it was a bit distressed, it seemed to be at odds with all the other sort of decency values that came through the, the, the other testing. What they discovered is that, as you briefly summarised, um, that it needs to be spelled out, is that people's perceptions of what we were actually spending on aid were wildly astray. When the first question had been asked, which generated that 70% plus hostility response, uh, people were given a dollar figure, uh, X billion dollars is what we're spending. Is it too much? Yes, they said. But the next year, they didn't give a dollar figure at all. They asked people to say, what do you think we're spending as a proportion of the national budget? And, and the, the, the most common response, the mean response was, was 14% or $14 in every $100 spent in the national budget. And then they were asked, you know, what do you think we should be spending? And they said, well, that's too much. We should cap it at no more than $10, $10, 10% of the national budget. 
In fact, the actual expenditure of aid that year in that budget was 0.8%, <laughs> or 80 cents in every hundred dollars. So when you, when you explore it, you see that the population, and I suspect most politicians as well, they wouldn't be familiar with this stuff. The population thought we were spending 17 and a half times as much as we actually were, but were perfectly happy to spend 12 and a half times um, as much as we actually were. So, and, and we know from other sources that there's a, there's a generous spirit in the Australian community with Ache and so on when it comes to aid. So I think, um, you know, you've just got to, you know, partly get the figures right so people understand what the nature of the commitment you're asking them to make actually is. And that's not really all that big a sacrifice at all. But the other thing is you've got to ride both these horses at once. Uh, you ride both the moral imperative, there's, you know, this is the right thing to do, but also for those who are going to be underwhelmed by moral imperatives, you ride the other horse um, of national interest, reputational return, and so on. I always love quoting, as I do right at the end of the essay, that uh, Scottish Labour uh, trade unionist of the uh, politician of the 1930s, Jimmy Maxton, who said, if you can't ride two horses at once, you shouldn't be in the bloody circus. And I think uh, this is the lesson that our policymakers could usefully make. Uh, ride the horse of appealing to people's better nature, but also ride the horse of appealing to hard-headed national interests. And there is a hard-headed return in being, in being seen to be a good international citizen. Well, speaking of hard-headedness, um, you touched on Russia's invasion of Ukraine in your opening remarks, but I assume you, <laughs> you recognise that a lot of people will actually be di diverted by the autocrat in the room at the moment. Um, you know, particularly when we've got such a significant and horrific event. Does this make it any harder or does it mean that we should, to, to make the arguments you're making or that we should adjust them given the circumstances? No, I don't think so. I mean, um, what we're seeing with the Australian response and a lot of the wider international response to the, the horror show that's unfolding in Ukraine at the moment is really an example of good international citizenship at work. I mean, in joining as we have, um, applying tough sanctions, giving uh, military equipment aid as we are, offering uh, refugee support as we are, um, this is this is classic in, in circumstances where frankly, what goes on in Russia, Europe, Ukraine is not really going to affect us all that much. Yes, if petrol prices go skyrocketing high, uh, then that will uh, you know, affect us along with everybody else and that'll feed into inflation and in turn feed into higher interest rates. Yes, we, we, we do run the risk of being um, disbeneficiaries of this, this horrible conflict. But mainly it's an exercise in in responding to what is just a grotesque violation of the international norm of peace and security and non-invasion and of other people's uh, sovereign territory about the values that are meant to be embodied in the United Nations. I think people see it in those terms. And um, I don't, I don't, and to the extent that our response in this has been a genuinely bipartisan one. And since we are responding like so many other countries are just out of a a sheer horror at the indecency of what's being perpetrated by uh, by Putin. I think, if anything, this might give a little bit more weight to the idea of the necessity for us to behave decently as an international community, to behave collectively, cooperatively, non-aggressively, and to work together to respond to violations of those uh, those common norms. So. Uh, you know, rather than rather than thinking of this as a diversion from uh, the enterprise that I'm advocating, I, I think in many ways it can be seen as a support of, for it. Um, I might turn to some of the audience questions, and Catherine Crittenden's asking a question that I imagine many people who haven't got to reading your book might ask, which is, which countries at the moment, in your mind, could be considered? decent and meeting the criteria that you're advocating and what might be the models that for us that emerge from them? Well, traditionally the Scandinavians, um, you know, particularly Sweden, Norway, uh, 
um, have had that reputation and deservedly so. Um, traditionally New Zealand and uh, traditionally, I suppose, Canada. These are the, the countries people hold up. I have to say that, um, you know, not always with great consistency, the Harper years um, for Canada were not uh, years of great, you know, from when was it, 2005 to 16, that, that sort of decade. Uh, that were they were almost trump like in their indecency certainly thatcher like and certainly howard like so canada didn't cover itself with glory i think in terms of its own pearsonian liberal internationalist tradition but overall it has and i mean canada for example was uh, was the sponsor of that big international commission that i co-chaired which uh, generated this concept of the responsibility to protect, which is, was a response to the terrible atrocity crimes, uh, particularly of the 1990s in Rwanda and, uh, and, uh, and the Balkans. So Canada's been there. Scandinavians, I mean, I, uh, I often quote um, Sweden in particular as a, as a good example of exactly the point that I'm trying to make, that good international citizenship is not just a matter of um, Boy Scout good deeds, but it's also a matter of hard-headed pursuit of, of national interest, because I've often made the point that squeaky clean Sweden, who everybody in the international community likes and trusts for its decency on human rights behavior, contribution to peacekeeping and uh, you know climate change and everything else. And, and a country who everybody basically trusts uh, also happens to be one of the biggest arms suppliers of conventional arms through Bofors and Cockhams and all those companies in the world. And there's, there's a little bit of a connection there. People don't mind buying arms from a country that they don't see as problematic at all in terms of its own values, its own behaviour. I've been taken to task uh, in various reviews of uh, for my... Uh, my cynicism about this, but I, of course I'm being ironic in pointing to the Scandinavians like Sweden as, as being beneficiaries of their good international system, because I do want to make this point and make the point quite strongly that, um, you know, the good international citizenship is something that, that squares the circle between um, realism and idealism, that the cynical hardheads really can embrace because there are hard-headed national advantages for it, um, apart from the warm inner glow advantage of doing morally the right thing. So they're, they're the countries we generally compare ourselves with, the ones that I've mentioned, that are genuinely, gen generally, more often than not, um, so regarded in terms of their behaviour. And that's, that's not a bad, that's not bad company to be in. If we just look at those examples um, that you've listed there, Gareth, and I, I don't, I hesitate to sort of get into the game of caricature, but of the examples that you've provided, it could be argued that Canada is the nation that probably shares most with us in terms of its scale in a, in a range of dimensions. Geopolitics in the wider sense, you know, particularly with closeness to the to the US and cultural affinities. Um, so what's got Canada to the position that you say it's in? And why have they, they taken themselves along that path? And how is their path different from ours? You know, what is what is what is the distinction? And I suppose what can we learn from the distinction? Well, to the extent that there is a distinction, I'm not sure that it's as acute as you mentioned. There may be something in the Canadian culture which is just a little bit different from our own. I mean, um, Canadians are famously the most polite people possibly in the world. The only people in the world who it's said, say, to an ATM machine after a transaction, thank you very much. Um, Maybe that's a caricature, but um, that's the way I've always found Canadians, just impossibly polite, impossibly decent in terms of their, uh, their social interactions, whereas Australians tend to be a little bit more robust um, in the way in which we, uh, we deal and interact with each other. But frankly, I, th I think you're exaggerating the distinction, um, David. I mean, it, it does it vary does from vary. time to time. I've already said that during the decade of the, um, the Stephen Harper administration, Canada did not rank as a very good international citizen at all. It really does, does depend on the ebb and flow of politics. And if you look back over the course of Australian political history, um, sometimes we've been very good international citizens indeed. And, um, you know, I, I would argue that, um, you know, the Evatt period, uh, we, we were so intimately involved in the creation of the United Nations, um, you know, parts of the, uh, the period of the, the Whitlam government, obviously, and a lot of the Hawke Keating government. I mean, I'm just a very self-interested position and people have got to discount accordingly. 
And I think we did demonstrate that we were just very, very conscious of these um, issues and wanted to contribute uh, valuable, you know, policy making to them. And, uh, you know, we, our, our stocks were pretty high globally and, um, you know, higher than Canada or anyone else's were as high during that period. So I think it just varies. And the, the important thing is to, um, is to ensure that the, <clears throat> the better angels of our, our political nature do, uh, do try up and that when, when governments behave as badly as the, the Howard government so often did on these sorts of issues, the Abbott government so often did, uh, not all Tory governments, I think Fraser, as I've said, was an exception in many ways, um, Fraser, the Fraser Peacock period. When governments do behave badly, uh, then I think you've just got to, you've got to call them out and not assume there's, um, there's something in the national psyche that explains this. It's, uh, it is a, a lot to do with the ebb and flow of politics, which is why, again, to come back to the basic theme of the book, it is important uh, to recognise that um, you know, decency politics is, I think, good politics. That there's a there's a there's a mood in the public that is not only tolerant but really quite approving of decency in all the ways that I've been describing. And uh, I think we ought to be much more conscious of that and play to it much more in our own uh, political campaigning. To my mind, at least, underlying all these things that you're arguing for is also an argument that we've got to be a lot more assiduous, a lot more consistent in everything we do in prosecuting our, our foreign policy. Um, and indeed, I, I suspect that also underlies some of your remarks about Canada, particularly under, under Harper. How do we get to that point? Well, there's, there's always tension between, you know, longer term interests and maybe some, you know, short-term challenge which makes you want to put things on the back burner and not pursue them so assiduously but and you know there is also the difficulty of maintaining consistency when you uh, even though you're, you're trying hard to do things proactively um, events keep happening and you're, you're forced into sort of reactions to them but consistency is is really incredibly important um, to the extent that you can that you can possibly um, produce it. And I think it's <clears throat> it's indefensible to be inconsistent on, on some things. I mean, human rights representations to, to weigh and balance your, um, you know, the strength with which you pursue human rights issues, depending on whether the country in question is a, an ally or a partner in security terms or a significant partner in trading terms, um, you know, and to, and to not do anything to, uh, offend or potentially offend anybody about anything if they're uh, if they're close to you and either of those things I, I think that's just that's just on the nose and you, you don't have to do that i mean i uh when i was foreign minister much to the dismay of some of my diplomats i i required them to constantly make human rights representations about executions or political prisoners or other um, you know, issues that, that Amnesty in particular was then raising. And to do so, you know, whatever the country was, whatever the nature of our relationship uh, with it was. The only, the only rule that I had then, which I would urge now um, on governments is the, um, is the productivity rule. I mean, you do obviously that which is productive, there's no, no argument about that. You don't worry too much about doing that which is unproductive because even if it doesn't bear immediate fruit, if you and particularly other like-minded countries are making the same kind of um, representations, putting the same kind of pressure, it can potentially have a useful effect over time. What you try to avoid, however, is, is doing that which is unproductive, which is, sorry, which is counterproductive, which is actually gonna make things worse for the people that you are trying to help. And of course, you sometimes do have to adjust your approaches for the different political cultures that are involved, the, you know, the face saving culture of so many of our Asian neighbours, um, you know, argues against being too strident in your representations, but it doesn't argue against making those representations at all. And good professional diplomacy, you know, can do just that. So I, I would strongly argue that a decent country, a good international citizen, is a country that not only has good values, but, but applies those values consistently and not, not selectively. Um, you do get into 
strife from time to time when you've got alliance relationships as close as ours are with the United States that have been in the past and the pressure that we've been under to engage in wars, as I've said, that have lacked either you know, ethical or, or legal justification. But, um, you know, that life can be pretty tough uh, when you're trying to navigate those sort of pressures. But um, at the end of the day, if you can navigate them and do that effectively, uh, your international standing is uh, is going to be infinitely higher, and uh, that redounds to your advantage and makes it possible to um, to deal with some of those putting pressure on you in a in a quite in a more effective way if you've got that reputational standing. To pick up your point about alliances and particularly the U.S. alliance, would we benefit from revisiting some of the efforts made, for example, under the Hawke government? become more of an independent actor within our alliance with the US and also to be more of an active and independent actor within multilateral fora? Well, I've uh, argued you know, quite specifically and I, I hope acted accordingly when I've had a chance to in ministerial roles uh, that we really do have to preserve our, our independence um, of action at all costs, whatever the the pressures are uh, upon us and that we demean ourselves if we become anybody's uh, you know, deputy sheriff uh, accepting orders rather than making our own judgments. Sometimes those judgments are going to be very tricky to make and there will be countervailing pressures and you're going to have to be accommodating of positions that you might not like. But, um, but you know, they're, they're fewer than, than one might think. And um, I just think, you know, being the, the reflexive acolyte of our great and powerful alliance partner, uh, you know, rolling over four paws, waving pink tummy exposed, um, is not the way to, um, to conduct your international relations. And it doesn't do you ultimately uh, any great credit. My, uh, my best example of, um, of the utility of an independent approach um, is really, and I've mentioned this in some of quite a few other things I've written over the years, is a um, conversation I had with James Baker, the US Secretary of State, um, when I was foreign minister and he was, um, he was leading US foreign policy, when he called me up one day and he said, look, um, we really, we're on common ground when it comes to chemical weapons. We, we, you know, this is a good international citizenship issue par excellence. Um, you know, we, we, we both countries, like so many others, want to ban these things completely. But the, the truth of the matter is, um, when we, whenever we try to lead the charge on this with, with the global audience with the chemical industry, we're just you know too big and ugly, and um, you know people are just not prepared to see us as acting in a, in a selfless and disinterested sort of a way. What we need is for you, Australia, to carry some of the water for us on this, to pick up the pieces and run with it. And you are going to be in a much better position to do that because you've been giving me and us a very hard time recently on Chinese most favoured nation status or some something rather. I can't remember what it was, but we've been visibly asserting that we weren't taking positions on international issues just because we were getting our directions from Washington. We were we were taking them for our own independent, well argued reasons. And Baker said to me, um, you know, very explicitly, you know, that's given you some credibility, which will be very helpful in advancing this particular um, this particular arms control objective. And it was, and um, you know, that's that's one of the big success stories of our period in government. But that that's the backstory to it, and I think it it helps make the point that um, you know, independence is not just a matter of of national national pride and national self worth. Uh, but it's also a, f a matter of uh, national effectiveness on the international stage. You do better uh, when you are perceived that way. And that goes for your second part of your question about multilateral uh, forums and engagement. Look, it's, it's very difficult um, very often to make progress in those sort of environments. The UN itself, its forums, the, the classic example. And uh, it's particularly difficult at times of major power, great power tension. But I do think you've just got to keep grinding away. And um, for countries like Australia to build coalitions, which we've been able to do very successfully when we've been at our best and seem to be at our best, uh, to be creative about policy, to find solutions and to bring other countries collectively and cooperatively with us, 
uh, is to be able to make you know big advances on many many fronts i mean that's the that's the spirit with which um, climate change has to be approached if we're going to make any progress that's the spirit in which pandemic response has to be approached if we're going to make any progress and i think the um and certainly on, on nuclear weapons as well and i think the um, the role of countries like us, although it can be very frustrating and sometimes you are steamrolled into submission, um, is, is, is very important and we've just got to keep on grinding away um, at that, uh, that, that set of tasks and trying to find like-minded support uh, from similar countries elsewhere. So you clearly don't buy the arguments that in circumstances like we face at the moment with great power tensions and the alleged breakdown of, a, of, of the Bretton Woods world, um, that it's tougher for middle powers such as Australia to prosecute these sorts of things in, within multilateral fora. Well, you know, of course it's tough, but it's always been tough. I mean, think how tough it was to make progress on anything during the entire period of the Cold War when uh, there was never the slightest chance of getting any kind of unanimity, um, any consensus on the Security Council. Um, you know, think how tough it was uh, to deal with the atrocity crimes that, uh, that burst out in the civilized world of ours with Cambodia in the 70s, with uh, Rwanda and Srebrenica in the 1990s. Think how tough it was then. Um, you know, even in the, the 1990s, when, when, when we'd moved into a post-Cold War, post-Cold War period, and there was much more, you know, cooperation notionally around, we were still found it difficult to get consensus around those, uh, those issues. This, this, is, this stuff's always been tough. But, um, but what you've got to do, I think, just to, uh, to quote that old line, uh, what is it from, um, from, uh, from Beckett? Uh, ever tried, ever failed. No matter, try again, fail better. I think that's the task for middle powers and uh, that's the task for all of us uh, in difficult political circumstances. Try again, fail better. Well, we might, uh, we might use that point to head down um, a path that John Langmore, who you, who you will know well, is inviting us to go down. And John makes the point that countries haven't always had large standing armies. And indeed, the, the UN Secretary General is advocating that in that sort of context, we, we start moving in the direction of looking towards comprehensive disarmament. Now, as John says, clearly a difficult task, but it might be an essential and valuable one if we're aiming to reduce violent conflict. John's asking, do you have any suggestions about how we might globally start taking steps towards comprehensive disarmament? Well, of course, that's an obligation under the non-proliferation, the nuclear non-proliferation treaty to uh, start engaging in serious negotiations toward that ultimate objective. I think it's, um, it's obviously, frankly, chasing a will of the wisp to think that we're going to achieve universal disarmament of conventional weapons uh, along with everything else. But it's not, I believe, something beyond our wit or our capacity to eventually achieve uh, to, to achieve nuclear disarmament, uh, because these are the most indiscriminately inhumane weapons ever devised, uh, despite the way in which they're being brandished again by Putin as we speak, they're weapons that are not usable in any conflict situation uh, because any, any use is, runs a terrible, terrible downside risk of them being used back at you and not achieving your, uh, your territorial objectives anyway. There's a whole literature about this, which I could go on about. Um, that said, I mean, there's a psychological comfort blanket dimension to that as there is for armaments generally, and it's very, very difficult to contemplate moving quickly to nuclear weapons elimination, but it's not difficult to contemplate moving towards um, nuclear risk reduction uh, with you know, an agenda um, consisting what I call the four Ds. I mean, um, nuclear doctrine, no first use, getting that universally accepted, um, reducing um, deployments, of those weapons that are physically primed and set to go, de-alerting, reducing their, their, their hair trigger alert um, launch status, and also decreased numbers. I mean, getting them down from 13,000 to you know, maybe 2,000 is the first objective 15 years out and going from there. 
So the, 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 there is an achievable agenda there, and Australia has been, the country has been very actively involved in spilling that agenda out. Um, so, you know, I don't think, you, you, and, you know, we, we've already talked about chemical weapons. Uh, the Biological Weapons Convention is out there with an absolute prohibition on that particular class of weapons. And um, a lot of effort is being made to reduce the stockpiles of the conventional weapons, small arms in particular, that fuel so many civil wars in so many parts of the world. But I think, um, you know, rather than thinking we're going to guarantee our security through getting rid of the, the weaponry, I think it's, it's crucial to recognize that the, the best way of achieving you know, genuine security is through... Um, through effective diplomacy, finding our security with others rather than against them. I mean, the real the real story of um, of NATO and, and Russia is not not the not the downside that was involved in NATO expanding up to Russia's borders, with all the resentment that that bred, which we're now seeing the consequences of. The real problem in the early 1990s, in that first flush of post Cold War exuberance, was stopping at Russia's borders. I mean, if NATO had been able to, the NATO countries had been able to reconceptualize what the nature of their agreement, their, their common agreement was, their security agreement was, to embrace the former enemy rather than continue to, to draw lines against it, uh, we'd be in a very different place today than we, uh, we are then. That water is now under the bridge, and we've got to claw back from uh, from the position that we're now in. But um, and you know, and and rather than a NATO so constituted, extraordinary as it sounds, including Russia, rather than that having no arms at all, um, there's something to be said for that particular grouping having a standing army, which could be deployed uh, by the UN with Security Council approval in um, you know atrocity crime uh, response situations in situations crying out for them because the un itself is is never going to have a standing army of its own and um, you know a lot of countries are deeply resentful of individual countries playing that role but if you've got a collective armaments uh, exercise of that kind um, you know maybe maybe we would have been in a better place in in dealing with that other dimension of good international citizenship stopping atrocity crimes that i've spoken of so this it's a complex issue but um and you know while i i would love to think that um, you know universal disarmament across the entire spectrum was achievable i don't think that's going to happen in any of our lifetimes or our grandchildren's lifetimes it's a it's a much more complex exercise Back to the Australian polity, Albert Delaney's noted that some of your, to the extent you've been critical of Australian politicians, there's, there's been a bit of a focus on the role of some liberal leaders. But he's asking, where does the National Party fit in all of this? You know, to what degree might they have been responsible for some of the positions of previous Liberal national governments, and what role can they play in future? Well, I mean, the uh, the troglodyte dimension of Australian politics, which has been so amply represented in the National Party for so long, has been in full display over the whole course of the climate um, debate, which is a, a quintessential good international citizenship issue, because there's all sorts of pain you have to suffer um, you know, countries like Australia if you're going to get the progress we need for the world as a whole to benefit and, in fact, to be, be saved from ultimate extinction. But uh, there haven't been too many National Party voices that I can remember um, speaking with any degree of clarity or rationality on that front. And, um, you know, similarly on, um, on just about all the other issues that I can think of, I don't want to be, you know, there's, there's always exceptions, there's always individuals that have been... Um, you know, the conscience of their party, but often lone voices. But, um, you know, but the, the, the fringe, one of the, one of the points I make in the book is that, um, you know, problems for the pursuit of good international citizenship can come from, come from a variety of sources, not just the, the cave dwelling resistors, but also from the, the super idealistic um, component of our society. I refer a couple of times um, to the way in which really critical uh, policy changes have been defeated uh, because they weren't perfect. They, they were good, but they weren't good enough. 
and I, I have to call out the Greens in this respect. I mean, I don't want to be partisan about it, but the, the Green response to Julia Gillard's Malaysia solution um, for refugees, the Green response to um, Kevin Rudd's CPRS, the Carbon Pollution Reduction Scheme, um, you know, to, to knock them off in the Senate, um, those proposals, not because they were bad, but because they weren't perfect was really just to succumb terribly to that, um, you know, best as the enemy of the good disease, which I think, um, you know, has been almost as troubling, not quite, but almost as troubling in some important respects in recent Australian policymaking as the, the outright opposition of the, um, of the cave dwellers. So, um, you know, I think you've, you've got to keep an open mind about, uh, about where the where the problems are coming from on the political spectrum and just work hard to uh, to address them. And um, while making an, a reasoned case on both moral grounds and on national interest grounds uh, for these taking these policy positions, um, well, that making a reasoned case is, uh, is not going to be always a, a sufficient condition. I think it's a necessary condition for achievement to be made. So, um, you know, the party like our own, the Labor Party, hopefully coming into government, I think um, just has to, to grind away at um, doing the best it can to make a reasoned positive case for all these things and not being too deterred by the, uh, by the opposition, which will come, you know, periodically from the right, yes, but also from the, uh, from the left. Well, look, Gareth, we, we're running very close to time, but I might just try and squeeze in one more question if I could. I, I don't know whether you saw it or not, but um, David Miliband had a piece in the New York Times um, about what might what we might need to think about next as far as the Ukraine goes. And among the points he made was he believes that Europe hasn't quite learnt the lessons of 2015 as far as migration crises go and refugee crises and still has to work through that with the possible exception of the Germans. Um, he also made the point that if the worst happens, and indeed even before the worst happens in the, in the current circumstances, we need to be thinking more about how we get humanitarian aid into the population of the Ukraine. And without spelling it out, but he did touch potentially on another thing that arises if the worst happens, where you at least have a substantially occupied, but not totally occupied Ukraine, that possibly something that you know a lot about, um, and that's responsibility to protect arises. Would you care to make any comment at this early stage in the, in the Ukraine situation? Well, we've already seen violations of the responsibility to protect principle with the, uh, you know, assaults on civilian um, residences and so on, which, you know, on any view constitute atrocity crimes, war crimes, and uh, are indefensible. And I'm delighted to see the International Criminal Court is picking up the pieces on that. As always, uh, with those sorts of issues and the institutional problems about, about enforcement, you can have all the agreement in the world about uh, the basic principles that are involved. And uh, you can have all the evidence in the world about the violation of those principles. But unless you can bring people to justice, um, you know, through extradition or through um, willing adherence to uh, international court systems and so on, uh, you're not necessarily going to make a lot of progress. Um, the best you can do in these situations is just um, collectively make clear um, the distaste for, you know, what's gone wrong to collectively put all the humanitarian resources that it's possible to mobilize to relieve the suffering of people both inside and outside the country, always difficult in a wartime situation because of the problems of access. Uh, you can do everything you can to, um, you know, to, to accommodate the, the refugee outflows that are bound to be associated with this, on which, um, as we all know, um, the global record has been uh, at best very mixed, but uh, at worst pretty poor. And, um, 
you know, I've already made the point in passing that um, I'm delighted to see the degree of unanimity that seems to exist around the place on the need to find places for, um, you know, for the Ukrainian refugees that are going to go on being unhappily displaced. Um, you know, much more sentiment there than there has been for refugees from the Syrian conflict or the Afghanistan conflict. And um, there are all sorts of elements of, um, of double standards involved here. But you can't again make the you know the best the enemy of the good and if we can't get perfection in our response to all these situations at least get it right in response to the one that was that is within our collective capacity to respond to so uh, i don't know what else uh, david Miliband is a very very competent good guy i don't know what else he was suggesting in that article but um when you're faced with a situation you know like this unfolding and it could get a lot worse, of course, before it gets any better, given Putin's apparent state of mind. Um, you know, all you can do is adopt the highest possible standards of response, um, adopt the greatest degree of collective cooperative response you possibly can. Um, don't make the best uh, the enemy of the merely good and just to you know, try to create the conditions for ultimately some restoration of normality that might involve some uncomfortable diplomatic compromises having to be made at some stage if the pressure builds up sufficiently, but um, we'll cross those bridges when we come to them. Unfortunately, there's uh, quite a few bridges ahead before the Ukraine situation gets, uh, gets any better than it is now, which is not a happy note on which to end, but um, one that is is realistic but none of this the basic point i want to make is that um you know whatever the distractions there might be and you know whatever the the total absorption there might be of our foreign policy making community with you know something like russia and ukraine uh there are many many other issues that are also demanding and clamoring for attention we can walk and chew gum at the same time and uh, we should certainly never let these value issues, these good international citizenship issues, and drop off the agenda. They're an absolutely, they're not optional extras, they're an absolutely central part of what should be our foreign policy position. Well, on that note, Gareth, it is time for an end. And thank you very much for joining us. As one of our audience members have said, you know, what's been especially telling and insightful tonight is once more your talent for reason pragmatism on display backed by some solid arguments so thank you very much um, for those who haven't seen it um, here's the book as they say available in all good bookstores but if you go directly to the monash university publishing site and apply the chifley 20 code you can get it with a discount it's well worth a read so thank you once more and thank you everyone for joining us Next week on the 9th, we'll be joined by Ed Coper, um, who's an expert on disinformation in the digital age. And he'll be talking to us both in the context of the Ukraine situation and the forthcoming Australian election. Um, Ed's just got a new book out on the topic and he's got some interesting and very well informed things to say. So on behalf of us all here at the uh, Chifley Research Centre, thank you and good night. Thanks, David. My pleasure.